الله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد Okay, uh, sisters, if you could turn on the television to HDMI 2, you'll be able to follow along uh, with the uh, PowerPoint presentation, inshallah. HDMI 2. Dr. Mukhtar, you need a mic, Sheikh. Doctor. Dr. Mukhtar, you need a mic, Sheikh. Oh, I need to ask now. No, bas. No, bas, tahor. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so um, is it up? Is it uh, running upstairs yet? Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Like, uh, inshallah, we'll start the questions, um, which you'll be able to see here. Can uh, somebody read question number one? What is the definition of belief in the hereafter? Okay, what is the definition of belief, belief in, the in the hereafter? Who wants to take a stab at that? Uh, the belief that we'll be judged in the hereafter. Now, you can't you can't define something with itself. So you can't say the hereafter is the belief that we'll be judged in the hereafter because now you you're making a circular definition. Huh? What's the belief in the hereafter? Yes. Well, once you, after after life, after, when you die, there uh, that you believe that you were uh, questioned in a grave. That you will have a day of resurrection? That, okay, so that's a sharh. That's a whole explanation you just gave me. I need a definition. Uh. Everything in that revelation has informed us will occur after death. Belief in everything that revelation has informed us will occur after death. Excellent. Tell you. Anybody disagree with that? Belief in the hereafter. Okay, we'll get there, inshallah. What are the minimum requirements for this belief? This is just review, Akhwan, and we need to make sure that we've grasped the things that we've covered so that when we move on, because the, you'll see that these things are built upon what came before. So what are the minimum requirements for this belief? That is belief, this belief. That is belief in the hereafter. Hmm, yes. Okay. Resurrection. All right, that is the reckoning. That's the same thing. Okay. Resurrection and reckoning and paradise and, and paradise and a hellfire. I mean, that is that that all of those who have died will be brought back to life. It's the resurrection. In the reckoning, that is that they will be held accountable for what they've done, and based on that account, they'll go to either paradise or or the hellfire. Well, yeah, the All right. Those are the minimum requirements, which means that every Muslim, and and I think this is important too, because when you talk about, for example, the fact that we have we live in a place where the Muslims make up two percent, perhaps, of the population, and we're out there, we talk to people about Islam, and people take shahada. We teach them about the hereafter. The things that you should focus on are the things that they have to know about the hereafter. The, the detailed parts about the hold, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, pond, if you will, the, the mizan, that there's a scale, that that scale has two pans, that there's a sirat, and all of the details about what happens, that should be left for a later discussion with them. They need to know certain things. Because these things are essential. If you don't believe that human beings are resurrected, then that is fundamentally disregarding or disbelief in a hereafter. Because everybody just stays dead. And then if they're resurrected but they're not held to account, okay, then then what exactly? Then what was the point of the test of this life, right? And if there's no reward for that, whether that reward is Jannah or whether that reward is the hellfire, 
if there's no reward for that, then that is also a manifestation of, or that, that is an indication that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just, amongst other things. All right, so this is the minimum requirement. Uh, and as one of the brothers asked, uh, you know, who, who has mentioned that? That is more the idea of minimum requirements is something more of a contemporary approach to the study of, of, of Aqidah. Um, from most our Mashaykh, and Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh and Sheikh Saleh Al Husaymi, uh, both of them, Hafidhumullah, they both put a lot of emphasis on the idea of minimum requirements when it comes to the tenets of faith. Um, and it's all it all goes back to what is known as Ma'lumun min Dini Bidurura, meaning that these are the things that are known by Islam without evidence. People know this no matter what. They, for example, if you ask people, what's the five pillars of Islam, right? If you ask a Muslim that, Muslims going to answer you. Do they know that that's the hadith of Ibn Umar or the hadith of Jibreel? A lot of Muslims don't know that. But they do know what the five pillars are. So this is known in Islam without evidence. Tayyip. Is there a difference between the hereafter and the last day? Explain your answer. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Father. Yes. Uh, so the hereafter, I would say, is Okay, I'm going to repeat that. So the hereafter is more uh, personalized, personalized, if you will. So if uh, this person dies, his hereafter begins. Okay? Yeah. The last day is, is something that happens for us all at one time. Okay. And the last day is something that happens for all of the creation at one time. Right. So the last day happens in the hereafter. But the hereafter is everything that happens after death. And so as, as we'll begin to see, inshallah, there is a distinction between, or there's a period between what happens when a person dies and the last day. And that period is called what? Al-Barzakh, which is the last question. What does the term Al-Barzakh mean? The Barzakh is the time period between when a person's soul is taken until until al qiyama until the last day okay type what is meant by the fitna of the grave yes okay right so fitna here refers to the questioning because a fitna is a could be a trial it's an empty hand it, it's a it's a question so what is meant by the fitna of the grave is the three questions that everyone will be asked in their graves. Now, the reason why we have here with the term Barzakh mean, it's because most people on planet Earth from the earliest of times until now, most people are buried. That's why it's called the fitna of the grave. Okay, and the Prophet ﷺ called it Adab al Qabr. Or he sought refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the torment and the punishment of the grave. But even a person who never has a grave, a person who was eaten by a shark, for example, they are still subject to the same process that everyone else is subject to. Okay, so Barzakh is actually a more, um, more comprehensive term for what happens after a person dies because the person may not necessarily be in their grave. Type. We're going to read out these questions very quickly. We're not going to answer them. Just read through them. Father Doctor, read the question, inshallah. For what reasons is one punished in the grave? Yes. How many times is the horn blown? What happens after each time? What is the meaning of al -Bat? Are animals subject to al -Bat? Discuss some of the Quranic arguments against those who deny the resurrection. List in order the events of the hereafter that we have covered thus far. Okay. Bismillah. Any questions about these questions? I'm not. I'm not saying. Do you not? Do you know the answers? Is there anything that's not clear about the questions? All right. We'll keep it moving. Bismillah. The long hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib 
Alright, so we stopped last week on this hadith, the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib about the barzakh. And in that hadith, the Prophet والسلام, details for us what happens to the soul of the believer. And he details for us what happens to the soul of the disbeliever. Instead of finishing that hadith, um, because we finished the part that deals with the believers we're going to read another hadith that has a very similar meaning and that is the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu it's shorter but it, it, it carries the same meaning Father read the hadith Shaykh لا من هناك عندك Abu Hurairah's first hadith yes no. Abu Hurairah radiallahu an reported that the messenger of Allah said Indeed, a dying person is witnessed by angels. If he were righteous, he, that is the angel of death, says, Depart, O good soul, that inhabited a good body. Depart in a praised state, and receive glad tidings of happiness, sweet aromas, and the Lord who is not angry. He continues to say this until it leaves the body. It is then taken up to the first heaven. Just, just so that we know, this hadith is collected by Ibn Majah. It's in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. And uh, uh, Albani graded the hadith is sound. Naam, Shaykh. It is then taken up to the first heaven where permission is sought for it to be admitted. It is said, who is this? He, an angel, replies, so and so. It is then said, welcome good soul that inhabited a good body. Enter in a praise state and receive glad tidings of happiness, sweet aromas, and the Lord who is not angry. This is repeated in every heaven until it is until it, meaning the, 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 the soul, finally reaches the seventh heaven, above which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for an evil man, he that is the angel of death says, depart, O malicious soul. That means bad and did bad to other people. O oh, malicious soul that inhabited a malicious body, depart in a condemned state. And our conscious, we try to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings that he gives us. But the, the gratitude that we show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to go beyond that to the things that he saved us from, much of which we don't even realize. And so, What's happening here in the grave uh, is that the good soul, the one who was pious in this life, is shown the hellfire because his gratitude increases to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after seeing that which he has been spared from. And so this the the idea that a shukr and he goes beyond or, or thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to also that which he has spared us from. Is there any specific way that we can show gratefulness for, for that that you just uh, said? Sheikh, Sheikh Hanif has done a series of, uh, of uh, khutab on that particular topic. And I'm not going to broach it now. Okay. Ask again? Yeah, yeah, we could, because it's, it's coming towards the end of the hadith now. An opening is made from his grave to the fire so that he sees its various sessions, sections, crushing each other. He is told, look at that from which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you. Another opening is then made from his grave in the direction of Jannah. And he views its grand door, that's a French word, meaning its greatness, its grand door and the things, the bounties that are in it. He is then told, this will be your position. You lived with certitude, you lived with certainty, you were sure about Allah's promises upon it, and upon it you died, and upon it you will be raised when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. Read that, read that part again, please. Another opening is then made from his grave in the direction of Jannah, and he views its grandeur and the things it, in it. He is then told, this will be your position. Why? Let's listen to why. This, this is going to be, when the hour is established, this is where you will be. You will be in Jannah. Why? You live mm -hmm. with certitude. 
You had yaqeen. You had yaqeen. You, you, you truly believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You believed in his deen. You believed in his messenger. Nah. And upon it you died. And, and you died upon that yaqeen. Right. And upon it you will be raised when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will. The evil person is made to sit in his grave in a state of fear and terror. He is asked, what did you do? He replies, I don't know. He is asked, who is that man? He replies, I heard the people say things and I, I said the same. An opening then appears from his grave in the direction of Jannah and he views its grandeur and the things, the bounties that are in it. He is told, look at that from which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deprived him. Another opening appears from his grave to the fires, and he observes its various sections crushing each other. He is told, this will be your place of living, your abode. In doubt you lived, upon it you died, and upon it you'll be raised when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. <laughs> Just wanted to go through that to finish some of the the what happens in the grave, and there are several uh, ahadith where the Prophet sallallahu explains that to us. And as we uh, discussed last week, the only way we know about what happens after death is through revelation. Uh, the stories about people who died and they came back and on a, they they didn't really die. Um, and nobody has been to the afterlife and come back to this life. Tell you, the second thing we're going to cover, reasons people are punished in the grave. And you heard here that the reason why this person was facing the hellfire was because of what? Because of doubt. Because he did not have certainty in his, in his deen. And doubt tends to stem from ignorance. When you don't have enough knowledge, you will doubt. Okay? And that's just the reality about anything in life. So if you don't know enough about this thing, then you may begin to doubt certain things about it. I mean, and that's just, uh, that's just how it works. So uh, you'll see this in the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim. So, Reasons people are punished in the grave. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimullah, and, I, and I, the only reason I'm mentioning Ibn al-Qayyim here because I really think he did a great job of summing up the reasons. So he breaks the reasons down into two categories. The first category, general, the general reason why people are punished in the grave. And then second category, there are specific reasons that the Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned why people are punished in the grave. So he says, rahimullah ta'ala, amma al-mujmal, فَإِنَّهُمْ يُعَذَّبُونِ عَلَى جَهْلِ يُعَذَّبُونَ عَلَى جَهْلِهِمْ بِاللَّهِ وَإِضَاعَتِهِمْ لِأَمْرِهِ وَارْتِكَابِهِمْ لِمَعَاصِيهِ That's it. The general reason why people are punished in the grave is because of their ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their jahl billah. They don't know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And so as you know, we spent the last two 10-week courses studying what? The names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. Trying to learn more about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because, and this is one of the things that will, to the contrary, save you from the punishment of the grave is that you know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. For جَعْلُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَإِضَاعَتُهُمْ لِأَمْرِهِ And that they neglect his commands. So those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs them to do, they neglect those instructions. وَارْتِكَابِهِمْ لِمَعَاصِيهِ And they commit those, they commit sins, they disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they ignore and neglect His commands, and they do those things that He prohibited him, prohibited us from doing. So, the opposite of those things is to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And if you know him, you will love him. You will hope in his reward. You will fear his punishment. You'll put your trust in him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you will do those things. You won't neglect his commands. And you won't intentionally disobey him. Especially not, you know, with major sins. 
He says, فَلَا يُعَذَّبُ اللَّهُ رُوحًا عَرَفَتْهُ وَحَبَّتْهُ وَامْتَثَلَتْ أَمْرَهُ وَاجْتَنَبَتْ نَهْيَةً He says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish a soul that knows him and loves him and obeys his commands and avoids his prohibitions. Alright? To the end of what he said, subhanAllah. And it's, um, Allah Akbar. طيب وأما الجواب المفصل فقد أخبر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن الرجلين اللذين رآهما يعذبان في قبورهما يمشي أحدهما بالنميمة بين الناس ويترك الآخر الاستبراء من البول. So as for the specific things, there are some hadith where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم talks about specific things that uh, a person is punished in the grave for. It. And so he mentions this particular hadith, which is famous, where the Prophet ﷺ walked by the two graves and he said that these two people are being punished in their grave. One of them was being punished because because he used to go between the people starting discord. Okay? And, and Namima, and as we mentioned on several occasions, that what Namima is is to take information from one party to another with the intent of either creating problems between them or or increasing the problems between them okay and so he this person can Namima Tibain and Ness he goes on to say and then I'll get back to the part where he talks about the issue of not cleaning oneself properly. He says, He said, this person, he was going between people creating enmity with his tongue. And this punishment is for him if he is truthful. Meaning he went to this person and said, you, you know, so-and-so says such and such, but he's not lying. He's not lying. That's still Namima. And it's a major sin. Okay? He said, and this is a, a, an indication and allowing you to see that the one who goes between people, creating enmity between them, not with the truth. The one with the truth is punished. This one goes with lies, slander, and false speech. This person is even punished even more severely. Punished even more severely. He says, And the other one did not used to clean himself uh, after urinating. كما أن في ترك الصلاة التي الاستبراء من البول بعض واجباته وشروطه فهو أشد عذابا. طيب. Anyway, so what he's saying here is that the second one, as as we know, a person after using the bathroom has to clean themselves properly. إما استنجاء أو استجمارا. And that they have to use water, or they have to use something else like uh, paper. They used to use rocks that is going to clean the area that was soiled. See it? And that is because, I mean, one of the reasons is because you have to be pure in order to pray. And so a person who did not clean themselves properly, then their prayer is not valid because they do not have purification, which is a condition for the validity of prayer. Play it. Number three, protecting oneself from the punishment of the grave. So we mentioned some of the things that we can do in terms of your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obeying his commands, avoiding his prohibitions. These are broad things. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to specifically seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hellfire. Abu Huraira, Father Shaykh. From the board? Yeah, yeah. Abu Huraira, ready to Narrated that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, said that when any of you says the tashahud in prayer, let him seek refuge with Allah 
from four. So there are other narrations that indicate after yani either faragha min tashahhud and once he has completed saying the tashahhud al akhir it says in, in some of the narrations. So in other words this is not to be said in the second rakah. This is to be said in the third rakah if it's maghrib or the fourth rakah if it is uh dhuhr asr or isha. Or if a person is traveling, then whatever the last tashahud is, and this is when they're going to say this. Now, O oh Allah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adab al jahannam. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the torment of hell. Wa min adab al qabr. And that's the point here for this particular study. From the punishment of the grave. No. Wa min fitnat al mahya wa al mabat. And from the trials of life and death. And from the evil of the fitna or the trial of Al Masih at the Jab. Nah. This hadith is collected by an Imam Muslim. And the reality is some of the early scholars of Islam, um Tawus, in fact, Rahimullah, one of the Tabi'een, um, he asked his son if he made this dua at, at the end of his prayer and his son said his son said no he said to pray again mm -hmm. and some of the people of knowledge understood that to mean that Tawus believed that it was wajib to say but um, that doesn't appear to be uh, the correct interpretation of Tawus's statement the reason why is because if you leave a wajib in salat, do you pray over? La. What do you do? You make such a tasahu. You pray over if you leave a, a rukin or you go back to where you left off an essential element of the prayer. Then you would go back to that particular point and start your prayer from there. But here, that's number one. So him telling him to pray over... It was his son on top of that, which is an indication that he was teaching him how important it was to make this. Do I go back and pray again? Right. Because now that I had to go back and do it over, I'm not going to forget ever again to say that. Whereas if you just pull him to the side and you say, hey, you know, at the end of the Salat, just say, you know, make sure your next time you say it, he might forget. You understand? So it appears to be in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best that he did not think it was from the waji back of salat even though the prophet sallallahu alaihi said say right either tashahhad ahadukum falyasta'idh billah yani it's a command from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but what's understood from that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best is that it is mustahab yani for us to say at the end of salat and we should never leave this off honestly i mean none, none of us should leave off asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of every salat Allah, before the taslim Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min a'adhabi jahannam wa min a'adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnat al-mahiyya wa mat wa min sharri fitnat al-masih al-dajjah Tayyip Naam, Shaykh How many of these duas like the dua al-sadr Abu Waqas and some other duas that you have mentioned to say at the end of the year So some of them are more emphasized than others right? So this one is heavily emphasized to the point like I said that some of the scholars Forget Tawus in this one. There are some of the scholars that held this to be wajib. Sheikh Albani, Allah yarhamu, from what I remember, he can't emulate that. And he used to lean to that position. Of some of the early scholars that said that this was, in fact, an obligation for you to say towards the end of your prayer. But there are several prayers, and that's what there, there are several things that you can say towards the end of salat. This is why Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he asked the Prophet, وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, said, after sending the salat and salam upon him, let choose what you will from the dua. Right? So this one, the hadith of Mu'adh, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Mu'adh, I love you, so don't leave off saying at the end of every salah, Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So that 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 one, the one of the hadith of Mu'adh, that's another one that is highly emphasized to say to at the end of your salat. I think the battery might be going bad. Shit. Okay. Tayyip. Uh, right now, 
Uh, this is something I wanted to cover last week. We didn't get a chance to cover. We're going to go through this fairly quickly. But the last day has several names. Um, Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned in his book, At-Tadkirah, which I talked about last week. At-Tadkirah bi ahwal al-Mawta wa umur al-Akhirah. Uh, he mentions 50 names for Yom al Qiyamah. Um, we're going to cover, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, something like that, inshallah. But the, uh, the reason why is because as they come in the Quran, you should be aware that this is talking about al Qiyamah. It's talking about the day of resurrection. Uh, Shaykh, Shaykh Hanif. I think I think the battery is uh, going bad on this one. Wallah, I mean, because I have to, I have to keep tapping. Play. Okay, so the first one, the first one, is just to show that it is called Al Yom Al Akhir, the last day. Okay, um, and don't mind the translations because I haven't looked at all of them. Um, so we just take this step by step, inshallah. All right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, "Lays al bir and to wal lujua kum kibla al mashriqi wal maghribi, wa lakin al birra man amana billahi wal yom al akhir." Okay, which is the point. Nah. So righteousness is not that you turn your faces towards the east or the west, but true righteousness is belief in Allah and the last day. Belief in Allah and the last day. Nah. Nah, nah, nah. I'll just wait, inshallah. Should be back up and running now. Bismillah. Okay. Bismillah. All right. So, uh, as you can see, it is definitely referred to as the last day. I'm sure you, you I mean, we all know the hadith of the Prophet, like someone who believes in Allah on the last day. So that's established. طيب. Another name for it is Yawm al Qiyamah. Yawm al Qiyamah. And that name is the one mentioned most in the Quran. Anybody want to take a stab at how many times it's been mentioned in the Quran? Yawm al Qiyamah. 70 times. 70 times in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَدَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِصْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ We place the scales of justice for the day of standing. La uqusimu bi yawm al qiyamah. I swear by the day of standing. And this last ayah in, uh, that I've mentioned here, Mutafifin, it just uh, explains a bit about what qiyamah means. Yawm yaqum al nasu ni rabbi al alamin. The day when mankind will stand before the Lord of the worlds, which we'll cover bi idnillahi ta'ala as we get there. It's also called yawm al hisab. And Al Hisab, we're going to cover next week, inshallah ta'ala. But Al Hisab means the what? The, the account. Right. It also does mean reckoning. In Yom al Deen, Al Deen who Al Jaza. It is the reward. It is the reckoning in that sense. Okay? So it's, it's similar in meaning. Well, call Musa. إِنِّي عُدْتُ بِرَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مُتَكَبِّرِ اللَّهِ يُؤْمِنُ بِيَوْمِ الْحِسَابِ Musa said, I have sought the protection of my Lord and your Lord from every tyrant who does not believe in يَوْمَ الْحِسَابِ Okay, in the day of account. يَوْمَ الدِّينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ Or مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينَ Both are correct. One means, what does Maliki Yom al mean? King. The king of the day of judgment. And Maliki Yom al the, the owner of the day of judgment. What's the difference between a king and an owner? The king gives legislation. Tell you, the king legislates. A huh? king might have control of every part of life in his kingdom. That is correct. So a king does not necessarily own what is in his kingdom, right? So he is both the king and the owner, which means he has absolute right to a tasarruf, to do as he pleases. The king 
I mean, you can live in a kingdom. The king doesn't have the right to do whatever he wants with your property. I mean, he may bring his army and, and do that, but that doesn't mean that he is just in doing so. And the one who is the owner of something, okay, but is not the king, ultimately doesn't have total authority over it either. He still needs permission to do certain things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both the Malik and the Malik. And Ibrahim said, وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ When he was uh, talking about who his Lord is, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, introducing, describing Allah to his people, he says, وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينِ He who I hope will forgive my sins on يَوْمَ الدِّينِ The day of reckoning. يَوْمَ الدِّينِ is mentioned, I believe, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, I believe it's mentioned 13 times in the Quran. As-sa'ah. As-sa'ah. وما خلقنا السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إلا بالحق وإن الساعة وإن الساعة لآتية فاصفح الصفح الجميل. We did not create the heavens and the earth, that which lies between them, except with truth. The hour is coming, meaning that last day is coming. So forgive. فاصفح الصفح الجميل. Forgive graciously. Let it go. Forgive. Why, why do you, what's the tie between that? Which, because that's why I mentioned the entire ayah. What's the tie between the fact that the hour is coming so forget? Sheikh Hanif is teaching you guys these principles of understanding the Quran and looking at the Quran. This stuff is not mentioned in this particular order. Now, if somebody wants to, hey, father. That uh, won't prevent you from crossing the sirat. It, 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 it may be a cause of you after crossing the sirat of having to iron out some things with other believers. Nah. This is reminiscent of when Allah uh, judged concerning uh, the, the, the uh, if of Aisha. Right. But so that if you want Allah to forgive you, then. Allah <laughs> Right, in, in Qissat al-Ifq, when Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was slandered and um, falsely accused of adultery by her own cousin. Not just, and not just her own cousin, but he was under the care of Abu Bakr the Siddiq. Abu Bakr was, his, was giving him money. He was taking care of him. And he was one of the ones who said that, and, and then he... he Vowed never to forgive him. One second, one second, Abdullah, one second. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him to forgive him and the believers by extension and said, Allah and Allah. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? And so it's a reminder. What happens when the hour is established? What happens? You are held to account. You're held to account. And you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you for what you have done. You don't want to be held accountable. So that's the tie. Remind you of the hour and then remind you on top of that, forgive. Those who disbelieve say, the hour will never be established. It's never going to come to us. Say yes, indeed, by my Lord, it will come to you. It's going to be established. From the names of Yawm Al-Akhir is Al-Waqi'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَادِبًا when the inevitable occurs of its occurrence, there is no denial. And it's called al waqia Waqia shaykh means it is happening. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it al waqia because it is inevitably going to happen. These are the last two we'll cover here, inshallah ta'ala. al haqa which a whole surah is named after al waqia a surah is named after al qari'a which is a name for qiyama a surah is named after al haqatu mal haqa wa ma adraka mal haqa the reality 
what is the reality and what will make you understand what the reality is. That's one interpretation of it. There's several others. Yawm al-hasra. Al-hasra is to regret. So it is the day of regret. Even the believers who will be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day and will be saved from his torment and will be from the people of Jannah will regret not having done more. Will regret not being at a higher station on that day. And once they enter Jannah, there is no more regret. And there is no, in Jannah, there is no jealousy, there is no animosity or anything like that. So a person on a lower level will visit a person on a higher level and there is no animosity between them. وَأَنذِرْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْحَسْرَةِ إِذْ قُدِيَ الْأَمْرِ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ وَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And warn them the day of regret, when the matter will be concluded. That's it. And they are in a state of heat, and yet they are in a state of heedlessness, and they do not believe. Tayyip. So it could be a potential sin not to forgive. Yes. Yeah. The question is, is it a sin not to forgive? And the answer is detailed because um, you don't necessarily have to forgive everybody for everything, depending on what that sin is and depending on what your forgiveness means. Um, so for example, if someone was a reckless driver, okay, and they killed, they killed a relative of somebody else, can we not forgive them and, and, and allow them to be punished for what they've done? The answer is yes. You can allow them to be punished. And you should allow them to be punished if they don't show remorse for what they've done. Because in that scenario, your forgiveness will allow them to go back to the sin that they've already committed. And so, you know, how you manage that is, is going to be based on circumstances. But in general, a believer is forgiving in general. And we, we are supposed to embody those qualities of the muttaqeen and from those of the people who are pious and from their qualities is that they are walafina and inness. They are those who pardon people. They overlook that. They keep it moving. Yeah. And especially the people that are closest to you. Because a lot of times what happens is you wind up holding grudges against people who live in your same house. I mean, that's not a way to live. So... Those are the things, and, and keeping keeping um, folders and keeping score and that type of thing like that, that's not a positive relationship. And so what happens is people who are petty don't forgive. And that's the opposite of being kareem, as we've talked about before. I mean, somebody who is noble in character. No. Nah. No. Nah. Without going too far in depth, how important, though, is it? as a Muslim to, okay, it's one thing to forgive, but to go, I guess, above and beyond to kind of keep certain ties and certain relationships. How, how can we deal with that without going in depth? <laughs> nah, I mean, the most important relationships, like I said, are the people who are, the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned have the most rights over you. So when the man came to the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, said, man, haqqun nas be, uh, uh, what's the what's the um the lava? Bisohbati, best. I think there's another. I think I'm missing a word there. But anyway, who who is the person that has the most right to my good companionship? The Prophet ﷺ said, Ummuk, your mother. Then he said, Then who? Your mother. Then who? Your mother. Then who? Then your father. Right. I mean, so the status of the parents in Islam, especially the mother, I mean, when you talk about you know forgiving, right? There's no doubt that your mother made mistakes when she was raising you. That's the 
بحسني صحبتي نا. who's the, right من حق الناس بحسني صحبتي who's the who you know is the one that has the right to my good companionship right and so your mother is going to make mistakes when she there's no catalog that you can just follow and go point by point and you know for each no this trial and error right so uh, in that sense they're the ones that have the most right to be forgiven if you are a Muslim and even if they're not and even if they're not right so if they make mistakes or they do things now again we're not talking about helping them do that which is which is incorrect so if somebody has a parent who is an alcoholic addicted to drugs or, or otherwise right that doesn't mean you give them money you know every week and you uh, you forgive and forget ah, I forget what happened last week when I gave you the money and then I you know then you went and bought some drugs with it no you understand so that that's where it starts and then it goes to those people who are closest to you and th and this, there's several a hadith of the Prophet that, that show that so then it would be like I said the people who are in your home your your spouse your children if you happen to be a child and you live with your siblings, you know, they have the most right to your good companionship. So, we've now, at this point, we've talked about the barzakh. And what is the barzakh? It is that period between when and when? To when a person dies and when the hour is established. When the hour is established. This is what we're going to talk about now, inshallah ta'ala. The establishment of Yom al Qiyamah. And it begins with, or this is, this is how life on earth comes to an end. All life. So, what we didn't cover um, intentionally is what they call alamat al sa'ah, or the uh, indicators, the signs of the hour, the signs that the Yom al Qiyamah is going to be established. Okay? And that's because that's only going to happen to a certain group of people. Everybody is going to die, and everybody is going to go through a period where they are in the Barzakh. Okay? The hour is only going to be established on a certain amount of people who are left on earth after the coming of the Messiah. Isa alayhi salatu salam and after he rules and then uh, after the wind comes and takes the souls of everybody who is righteous and there are only wicked people left on earth and then the horn is blown. Now, I'm sure. The blowing of the horn. On the day when the horn is blown everyone in the heavens and on earth will be terrified except Except such as Allah wills. Yani except those who Allah wills. Nah. And all will come to him in utter humility. Okay, so وَيَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فِي السُّورِ فَفَزِعَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Okay, الْفَزَعَ is to be terrified. Okay, so the horn will be blown. And as we'll cover inshallah, the one who blows in the horn is an angel and his name is Israfil Israfil and he is the one who blows in the horn by ijma by consensus of the scholars of Islam even though the textual evidence for that there's no particularly one sound hadith but there are several hadith that at least four that indicate that he is the one they're all they're all weak all right, uh, but they strengthen each other in the fact that it is Israfil who blows in in the horn, and the Prophet ﷺ described him in a hadith, and he said that the angel who has been appointed to blow in the horn uh, stares towards the Arsh and does not blink and has not blinked since he was created. Waiting for the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to him to blow in the horn. For fear that the command may come and he's blinking. And he described his eyes as being radiant like two stars. The Prophet said. And he stares. 
and he's waiting. In another hadith, the Prophet wasallam says, Kayfa and I'm, you know, how, how can I relax when the angel who has been appointed to blow in the horn has brought the horn towards him and has tilted his forehead? That's, the, that's what the Prophet said. Tilted his forehead towards the arsh, waiting for the command. How, how can I relax? And I know that the hour can be established at any time. No. Astamish. And the horn will be blown, whereupon everyone in the heavens and on the earth will be stunned, except, except those whom Allah wills. Tay. That ayah we're going to finish in the next part, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصور. And the horn will be blown. فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ الصعق. I want you to look at that. There's a difference between فَزِعَ which means they're terrified وَصَعِقَ which means that they are uh, made unconscious, basically. Um, it's a, here the translation says stunned. But the same word is used uh, for, uh, to describe what happened to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to look at the mountain. When he asked Allah, show me yourself. Erini, anzur ilayk. I want to look at you. Allah said, look towards the mountain. So when he looked towards the mountain, فَخَرَّ Musa sa'iqa. He just fell down unconscious. He could not, because he can't say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his life. فَلَمَّا أَفَاقَ So it, when he came back, came to, when he woke up, uh, then he says, Subhanak, uh, what's the ayah? Tuba tu ilayk. Right. وَأَنَا أَوَّلْ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ I have repented to you, turned to you and repented. I'm the first of the believers. So the, the reality is, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is just uh, for those who want to dig a little deeper, the issue of as-sa'k and what exactly that means here. Does that mean everybody who is on heaven and earth will die uh, or that they will, be, that they will just go unconscious? There's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on exactly what that means. The point is that the horn will be blown and everyone who is on earth will be st stunned first and then and that's what that's what some scholars are saying that w which appears to be the most correct is that first they'll be terrified and then that will lead to them basically dying you never you ever heard scared to death basically now nah. follow Sheikh. The the, this, this, this is a part of a hadith from Sahih Muslim narrated on Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As that the Prophet sallallahu said and then he brings this long hadith and this is part of it here. Father Shaykh. Then the horn will be blown. Anyone hearing it will tilt his head. The first one to hear it will be a man busy preparing the basin for his camels. He will fall unconscious as will the rest of the people. Allah will send rain like dew or shade which will cause the bodies of the people to grow. Then it will be blown again. Tayyip, how many times will it be blown based on this? Twice. We're going to cover that. So what happens after the first time? Everybody falls unconscious or perhaps they die. And then Allah sends rain down. And the rain will hit the bodies of the people, even the people who are in their graves. Because the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that there's a part of the human being that will not decay. The tailbone, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best. Because the tailbone does decay. But there will be a part of the tailbone that's like a seed that will remain. And seeds are not, seeds remain. I don't know if you realize that they're very difficult to get rid of certain seeds. Anyway, the part of this, the human being will remain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down the rain. Qatalli aw qadilli. And that's the uh, doubt from the narrator. That's why it says like dew or shade. Okay? 
and it will come down in the same way the vegetation grows the people will come back to life Ikhwan, this is what our Prophet والسلام, is telling us is going to happen and so is going to happen and it will happen to each and every human being and we should be thankful that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us revelation that allows us to see clearly what our real life looks like and the, the hereafter is the real life Naam Shaykh that is uh, not directly related to it but it, the scholars mention it in the same in the same context because everything will cease to exist Naam Shaykh and this is this is a Sahih al-Bukhari Nah. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said, The hour will not be established until the sun rises from the west. And when it rises from the west and the people see it, then all of them will believe in the law. But that will be the time when no good it will do to a soul to believe then. If believed, not before. I mean, at that point, there's no more test. Life is a test. And if you can see all the signs, you saw every answer, you saw every, then there's no test at that point. When the sun rises from the west, it won't be a benefit to believe at that point the same way it was no benefit to Fir'aun as he was drowning to say, and he didn't even, wouldn't even, still wouldn't say out of his arrogance, still would not say la ilaha illallah. What did he say? Amentu billadi. Huh? Fir'aun, no, he didn't say Ilahu Musa. And the one who, not Musa, la, the one who, Aminat bihi banu Israel, the one who the children of Israel have believed in. He wouldn't say La ilaha illallah still. Well, he did say that from before, not when he was dying, he didn't say, Anna uh, He was begging. Nah. Fadah. The hour will be established so suddenly that two persons spreading a garment between them will not be able to finish their bargain. Yeah, I mean, they won't be able to finish their transaction. They, that's the so they put the spread. They're ready to, you know, make their transaction. It's the hour is established. Nor will they be able to fold it up. The the at this point the horn is blown. That's it. Every everything is over. The hour will be established while a man is carrying the milk of the she camel but cannot drink it. And the hour will be established when someone is not able to prepare the tank to water his livestock from it. And the hour will be established when some of you has raised his food to his mouth but cannot. In other words, the person goes like this to, and the hour is established. It won't even make it to his, his mouth. This is the how quickly uh, it will be established when it is established. All right, so this is the first blowing of the horn. And that, the blowing of the horn at this stage wipes off or, or gets rid of life in the heavens and in the earth. In the earth and in the heavens. Illa man sha'a Allah. Except for those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. And the, the correct opinion on that is that we don't know exactly who those people are. That is those whom Allah wills or not they're not necessarily people because some of the some of the scholars of tafsir say that that refers to the Hurulin. Um it refers to the Gilman in Jannah the, the, the boys in Jannah the um, the boy servants that are in Jannah the Hurulin, the I don't want to call them women but um, what do you call the Hurulin? how do you translate that huh the, just just be on the safe side and leave it. I think even in English they say hor. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and, and some say, no, it's referring to the angels like uh, Jibreel and Israfil and Mikael. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Shaykh was saying, Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, there's no uh, authentic text. And these are issues that go back to revelation. We don't have revelation for We leave it as it came. So this is what's going to happen. And then there's going to be the second blowing of 
the horn. Naam, Sheikh. The second blowing of the horn, and the horn will be blown, whereupon everyone in the heavens and on the earth will be stunned. Okay, this is when Yasak. Yeah, so they'll be rendered unconscious, they'll die, with whatever way we're going to translate that, except those Allah wills. Nah. Then it will be blown again. Then it will be blown again. Nah. Whereupon they will rise up looking on. Okay, so at this point, when the trumpet is blown, the horn is blown the second time, everyone will come out of their graves. Everyone will be brought up. They will rise up looking on. On that, on the day the blast of the horn will call. So in Surah Nazi'at, and this is another name for the first blowing of the horn, is Ar-Rajifa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَ On the day the blast of the horn will cause a violent convulsion, and the second blast follows it. تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَ Second follows it. Now. They do not awake except one blast which will seize them while they feud, while they argue. That's the, the first one, a sayha. That's the first blast, the they first not, blowing of the horn, right. They, they will not be able to make a will, nor will they return to their families. That's it, right. Then the horn shall be blown, and at once. This is the second up. time it's blown. Then the horn shall be blown the second time, and at once they will rise, rise up. From their graves and hasten to their Lord. Right. And the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> says it's a continuation of hadith that we started before, then it will be blown again. Now, nah, whereupon? Whereupon they will rise up looking on. It will be said, O people, Ya Nas, go to your Lord. Then there will be a command. Waqifuhum innahum mas'ulun. Stop them. They are to be questioned. So this is the second time. So the first time, what happens? Everything on earth and in the heavens ceases to have life. Okay? Except for those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. The second time is blown. Everyone rises up. So, who's subject to the first blowing of the horn? Only those who are currently living at that time. Okay? The second blowing of the horn, everyone, everyone who has ever lived will experience that. Nah. Abu Huraira, ready Allahu anhu, said, Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, between the, the two sounds of the trumpet, there will be 40. Someone asked Abu Huraira 40 days, but he refused to, to reply. Then he asked 40 months, he refused to reply. Then he asked 40 years, again, he refused to reply. Uh, Abu Huraira, ready to one, added, then after this period, Allah will send water from the sky, and then the dead bodies will grow like vegetation grows. Allah So here, I mean, what we what we see here, Abu Huraira, radiAllahu taala, and who narrates that the Prophet wasalam, says that between those two, the first time the horn is blown, and the second time the horn is blown, there will be forty, and then he stopped because either the Prophet wasalam, said forty. And did not say days, months, years. And he didn't ask the Prophet Sallallahu Or the Prophet Sallallahu may have said it. And he didn't remember what the Prophet Sallallahu said. And the first one is more likely. And so when they asked Abu Huraira, what, 40 days? Kala abaytu. I refused it. He said about it. I refused to answer. They said 40 months. He said I refused to answer. 40 years, I refuse to answer. And then he added, after that, Allah will send water from the sky, and dead bodies will grow like vegetation grows. Tell you. Here, uh, 
Yeah. I'm going to have to skip some of this just for the sake of time. But what needs, what, what, what I want to be clear is that, uh, and we'll talk about this when we talk about al which is, which is coming, inshallah, which is uh, when everybody is gathered together. What, what's happening between, it, what's happening during that time span of 40, whether it's 40 days, months, or years, or whatever it may be, is this is when the earth is being changed. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ yani When the earth is being changed to another earth. Uh, it is during this time, this is according to yani one opinion of, of the scholars, when you read in the Quran, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ When the heavens are split asunder and these type of... That is happening now. Not now, as in now. I'm saying that's happening in this time period between when the, uh, when the horn is blown the first time and the second time. Because basically, once everybody is raised, everything has changed. Nothing looks the way it looks now, as you'll see, inshallah, uh, you know, as, we, as we get there. And so this is when all of those things in the Quran that you read about what's happening on, in the hereafter, many of the scholars say that this is the time that it is happening in between the two blowings of the horn. So here it says, then after this Allah will send water from the sky, dead bodies will grow like vegetation grows. People will be brought up from their graves. So we get to our next point, which is Naam Sheikh. The meaning of al bath Quranic arguments for al bath They're in al araf right, 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 right. Okay, so that's the number one. The meaning of al bath which which can be translated as resurrection. So basically, the bath is includes the restoration of the body. The restoration of the body. And this is another important point, which is that the belief of Ahl Sunnah is that people will be brought back together. It's not just your soul, it is your body as well. Not just the soul in the hereafter, but also the body. And if you remember the story of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, uh, in Surah Al Baqarah. When he says, Rabbi Adani, Kaifa Tuhil Mota, O my Lord, show me how you bring life to the dead. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell Ibrahim? Take the birds and do what? Right. Cut them into pieces. And then what did Allah do? Did he create new birds? He brought those ones back together. So, so this is how Allah Subhanahu this is the example that Allah gave for bringing life to the to the dead. So similarly, whatever condition a person's body was in, burnt to a crisp, cremated, eaten by lions and tigers or sharks or whatever, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring the bodies back together and they will be different. There will there are similarities and there are there are some similarities and there are differences. All right? But um, the, the reality is that people will recognize other people, which means that there's, there has to be some degree of similarity. The day that a person will what? Flee from his own brother. How does he know that's his brother if they're just souls? No, he recognizes them. There is a Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us back and Allah knows best how that is done. But the point is that resurrection is not just of the soul. That, that's the point here. So it's restoration of the body and bringing it back to, uh, to life for the resurrection. So that, that, is, the, that is what the ba'ath or ba'ath, excuse me, is inclusive of. All right. Quranic arguments for al baath We won't go through all of these, but we'll take a quick look, inshallah, at uh, Al-A'raf. Uh, you all have your mushaf, right? Bismillah. 
somebody uh, volunteer for us. Wow, not all at once. No, Father Abdurrahman. Can't you come over here? Oh, that's not it. But but in Glizi, okay. And it is he who sends the winds as good good tidings before his mercy until and it is he who sends the winds as good tidings before his mercy until when they have carried heavy rain clouds. We drive them to a dead land and when when we send down rain therein therein and bring forth thereby some of all the fruits. Thus we will bring forth the dead. Perhaps you may be reminded. Sim right. Similarly, we will bring forth the dead. Huh? We will raise up the dead so that you may take heed. Right. So what what a, what comparison is being made here? Allah says similarly, we raise up the, the dead so that you might take heed. Similarly, similar to what? Similar to ve okay vegetation. What what's but what 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 happened to that land? The land is barren. When you look at it, there's nothing there. Water comes down, and then what? And then it starts to grow. Life comes back after it was dead. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, similarly, we raise the dead. We bring life back to that which was that which was dead. That's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring life back to that which was, which was dead. That argument is made several times in the Quran, several different ways. Uh, to be honest with you, and, and inshallah, Sheikh Hanifa help me with this, but uh, I would love to give you all homework if I really thought you were going to do it. In fact, I'm going to give you some homework. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. Not homework. Um, that that's that's one way, and there there um, there are several ways that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, or several different um, um methods that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uses in the Quran to, as like logical or rational proofs that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala brings life back to the dead. Look at Surah Yasin towards the end. And we'll just read that first part of it. You got it, Sheikh? Oh, Alam Yarad Insan, and Khalaqanahu min Nutafatin, Faida Hua Khasimu Mubin. Does man not look at the fact that we created him from Nutfa, right? That little drop, that little, that drop, a mixture of Ma in Mahid, of a despised liquid, min Nutafatin. But yet we still find him an in, in, uh, 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 ardent disputer. Right? And he has brought forth a parable for us and has forgotten his own creation, the way that he was created. He's going to say, who is going to bring life back to these bones once they turn to dust? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He or me. Kul yuhyiha alladhi ansha'aha awwala marra. Say, the one who created them the first time is going to be the one to bring them back. Is going to be the one to restore them. Look, it's not difficult. If you did it once, you could do it again. I mean, it's, it's, it's like anything else. Uh, I, you built the house. Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, strong wind came, took the house away. You can't build the house again? You built it the first time. As a matter of fact, the second time it's Easy. easier. You know what you're doing now. I mean, and, and this is uh, because he knows what he was doing from the first time. But to Allah belongs the best example in this. So if it was, if he could do it the first time, what makes it so difficult to do it the second time? Allah Azza says, "Ya ayuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum. Ya ayuhan nas, in kuntum fi raibin min al baath. O mankind, if you are in doubt about." Al-Ba'ath, the resurrection. For inna khalaqnaakum min turab. We created you from turab. 
from, from dust. ثُمَّ مِنْ نُطْفَ And then from that drop. ثُمَّ مِنْ عَلَقَ And then from a clot. ثُمَّ مِنْ مُضْغَ To the end of. But the point is, he started with what? We created you from? Tura. This guy comes and challenges the Prophet ﷺ and says, you, you can't. Uh, how? What's going to happen? What, what do you mean this resurrection? Man, you I mean, who's going to bring life back to these bones once they turn into dust? <laughs> you were created from dust in the first place. <laughs> the one who created them the first time, he's going to bring the one, be the one to bring them back. Another name for al baath which you'll find also is synonymous to it, is an nushur and you'll find that in several du'as uh, of the Prophet ﷺ. Tayyip, keep going, Shaykh. Sake of time, we gotta go. Uh, first to rise. First to rise, yes. Allah's Messenger ﷺ said, I will be the leader of... Al-Isra is homework. I'm serious about this. I want you to go back, read Tafsir Ibn Kathir for Al-Isra 49-51. And it, uh, again, uh, this is something that, you know, if we had the time, we would go and kind of focus on these arguments, the methods that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran, perhaps in the next uh, course, inshallah. Right now, we need to get an overview. Father. I will be the leader of the children of Adam on the day of resurrection, and the first one for whom the grave will be split open, the first one to intercede, and the first one whose intercession will be accepted. Now, so the first one to rise from the grave will be the Prophet Isaiah Salatu A lot there's a lot that could be said about that, but we gotta keep it moving. Now, next topic after so we've covered what so far? So after the barzakh is what? The horn is blown. The first horn. Then there's a period of forty. Then there's the second horn. After the second horn, the second horn is letting us know that it is time for al baath the resurrection and with once everybody is raised from their graves then there is al hashr the gathering qul inna al awwalina wal akhirina la majmu'una ila miqat yawm ma'lum say verily those of old and those of later times all will surely be gathered together for an appointed meeting or appointed meeting of a known day وَحَشَّرْنَاهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَمْ نُغَادِرْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا We shall gather them all together so as to leave not one of them behind. And Allah azza wa jal says أَيْنَ مَا تَكُونُوا يَأْتِي بِكُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Wherever, wherever you may be, Allah will bring you together. Yani on the day of resurrection, it doesn't matter where you die, what land you die, everybody's going to be gathered together. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Allah is truly able to do all things. Allah Azza wa Jal goes on to say, and these ayat are the, are the scholars have used to show that not only will human beings be gathered, but also, also the animals. And that's because the purpose of the gathering is what? For what purpose are people being gathered? For the reckoning. For the reckoning, which we'll cover next week, inshallah ta'ala, or we'll begin next week. And so... The animals also, as a, as, a, as a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice, he brings those animals together. This one scratched out the eye of that one. This one hit this one with a horn, and he didn't have a horn to defend himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will settle the score between them on Yom al-Qiyamah, and then they will turn into dust. But the point is, justice will be done. Justice will be done. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And that There's not a moving creature on earth, a living creature, nor a bird that flies with its two wings. But but that they are communities like you are. We have neglected nothing in the book, then unto their Lord they shall be gathered. Thumma ila rabbihim yuhsharun. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ Right? In Surah Taqweer. And when the wild beasts shall be gathered together. Father Shaykh, uh, Iqra. The Prophet delivered a sermon and said, You people will be gathered before Allah on the day of resurrection, barefooted, naked, and uncircumcised. The Prophet 
As we began the first creation, we shall repeat it. Right. He added, the first man who will be clothed on the day of resurrection will be Ibrahim. And then there's a story that goes with this. This is collected by Bukhari and Muslim on the authority of Ibn Abbas. How much time to Maghrib, Shaykh? Come, Bucky. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. All right. So. This, this, the Prophet ﷺ is explaining how the people will be gathered and that they will be, they will be raised, gathered before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. Ibrahim ﷺ will be the first of the people clothed and then following him will be the muttaqeen in general. And we're, that's a story for a different day. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and had reported that she heard the, Allah's Messenger say, people will be assembled on the day of resurrection, barefoot, naked, and uncircumcised. Same thing that Ibn Abbas heard. But then she said to Allah's Messenger, will men and women be together on that day, looking at one another? Notice the haya, subhanAllah, yani that, that they had. Yani, Allah, subhanAllah. So the Messenger sallallahu said to her, Aisha, the matter is too stressful for them to look at one another. In another narration of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, recited the ayah, لِكُلْ لِمْرِ إِنْ مِنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ شَأْنُ يُغْنِي On that day, every person will, ha will have an affair that will keep them preoccupied and busy. Nobody's worried about anybody else, period, on, on that day. So this is happening with the hasha. This is before the hisab. Okay? This is before the account. The, I, I understand the progression of affairs. The, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Sequence. The chronology. Sequence. Yeah, sequence. Okay? See, I, so all of this is happening before the hisab, once everybody is raised. And then the Prophet said, and then we're almost done. And this should be very scary for everybody. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and who said, I heard Allah's Messenger say, every servant will be resurrected upon the condition in which he dies. If you died upon yaqeen, you'll be resurrected on yaqeen. If you die in doubt, you'll be resurrected in doubt. If you die in ihram, you will be raised in ihram. The Prophet said, for the man that died in ihram, don't cover his head, don't put any perfume on him, for innuhu yuba'athu yawm al qiyamati mulabbiya, because he will be resurrected on the day of judgment. Making the talbiya. So a person has to be scared. You die drunk, you get raised drunk. You die high, you get raised high. You die saying la ilaha illallah, you get raised saying la ilaha illallah, which is why the Prophet والسلام, instructed us to laqinu motakum la ilaha illallah. Say frequently around those who are dying. I and mean, when you're around them, just keep saying la ilaha illallah. Try to get them to repeat after you, saying, La ilaha illallah, whoever has his last speech in this life, La ilaha illallah will enter paradise. And so a person is going to be resurrected upon what he died on. So be careful. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a good ending, a good conclusion to this life. The mahshar, what does this, what does this place where you are gathered, the, uh, the place where you are assembled, what does it look like? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضُ وَالسَّمَوَاتِ وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَرْهَارِ On the day when the earth will be replaced by another earth, and the heavens likewise, and they, that is everything, will appear before Allah, the one, the dominant. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam said, يُحْشَرُ النَّاسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ عَلَىٰ أَرْضٍ بَيْضَاءَ عَفْرَا لَيْسَ فِيهَا عَلَمٌ لِأَحَدْ سَهَلْ بِنْ سَعَلْ رضي الله تعالى عنه reported that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said people will be assembled on the day of resurrection on a white plain with a reddish, reddish tinge so it's not strictly white there's a little red to it hint of, of red like a loaf of bread made of pure flour meaning there's it's, it's just all one consistency okay there will be no landmarks for anyone and this is where the people will be gathered. And inshallah ta'ala, next week, we'll talk about what happens on that day that they are gathered. And what is going, and, and what the hisab is, and what the mizan is, and the books that each person will be given, and so on, and, and, and so forth about what happens on the day. It's time for their then. Call their then. Sure. Oh, alhamdulillah. Uh, 
Very good. For what reasons one punished in a grave? There's general and specific. The general reason is what? That they that they do not know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. They they're they're ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they neglect his commands and they and they what? And they do. They sin. They 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 do those things that he has prohibited. There are specific reasons like yes. They go, yeah. they, go right with the, the main they fall under the main reason, but these are specifically what what the Prophet saw him not cleaning himself. Yeah. Right, is Namima is a prohibition. Right, not cleaning himself is leaving off, neglecting a command, and and spreading Namima is doing something that was prohibited. How many times is the horn blown? Twice. Twice. What happens after each time? So after the first time, after the first time, life halts. Right, and then we have that period of 40. And during that period of 40, the, the earth changes. All of these things are happening. The sky is split asunder and so forth. What happens after the second time? People are resurrected and they are taken to the land of assembly. What is the meaning of al-ba'ath? Resurrection. Are animals subject to al-ba'ath? Yes. Discuss some of the Quranic arguments against those who deny the resurrection. That's going to be for next week. We'll save that list in order. The events of the hereafter that we have covered thus far. We've covered what? B. The Barzakh. Which starts with Fitznatil Qabr. And then the Adab or the Naim of the Qabr. The, the, okay? From the Barzakh, then we have the blowing of the horn. The first time. And then we have that period of waiting. 40. And then we have the second blowing of the horn. And then we have the Resurrection and then the Hashab, the gathering. Wallahu ta'ala adam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala nabina Muhammad subhanaka Allah wa alhamdulillah. Ashadu wa la ilaha 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 ilaha